Welcome everyone to today's talk is about bugs, the good, the bad, and the annoying. Today's class is a 10 minute university presentation offered in collaboration with in and in support of the OSU Extension Service Master Gardener Program. So I hope you enjoy today's talk. This is a list of some of the 10 minute university handouts that you can find if you go to cmastergardeners.org. We have put together a lot of handouts. These just happen to be those that have to do with insects, which is today's, what today's talk is about. But go to cmastergardeners.org and you will find many, many more handouts on a lot of different subjects. Now, Oregon State University Extension also has a very large selection of publications about insects. The ones that you see here on the screen are just a few of those that are available. I would definitely suggest that you go to the OSU Extension catalog and see all the great publications that are available for you to download free of charge. Another great resource that we use that is the Washington State University Extension. They have a lot of publications too, and a lot of their publications and Oregon State Uni University publications for the extension, they work together for a lot of these publications. So either one of these links that you see would be good for you to use when you're, when you're wondering about what to do about all the insects you find. Okay, now to get started. These are the objectives that I hope to, to get to you today to become familiar with some of the common insects, to find out which ones are good, which ones are bad, and which ones are just very annoying, to learn some management options for these pests, and to see a list of some of our newest invasive insects that have come to our area. Now, spiders, are they good or are they bad? And I'm sure some of you are going to say they're bad, but no, spiders are good. Spiders are a predatory insect. They eat other insects, and many of those insects that they eat are pests themselves. Without spiders, your home and yard would just be covered with insects. So spiders are definitely good. And of course, pe many people want to know about our poisonous spiders. I know you hear a lot about brown recluse, and we have a lot of people that will call the office and say, I think I have a brown recluse spider. Well, we do not have brown recluse spiders in the Pacific Northwest. There are 11 species of brown recluse spiders indigenous to the continental United States. Four of those are known to be harmful to humans, but the brown recluse spiders are established in only 16 states and none of those states are in the Pacific Northwest. We do once in a while come across black widow spiders in the Northwestern Oregon, but they're more, more common in Southwestern and Eastern Oregon. They're not often found, they are most often, excuse me, found on the south facing slopes that are rocky or bare of dense trees, but on occasion, you may see one that travels into your house or basement or garage. All right, ants, are they good or are they bad? Well, carpenter ants are very bad when they are found inside of structures. The one thing that a lot of people don't realize, they think that carpenter ants are eating their wood. Termites eat the wood, but carpenter ants, they chew up the wood to make their own homes, to make their nests, or to expand their nests. So they're not actually eating up, but they are doing the damage by chewing up the wood. They're attracted to wood that is partially decayed. That's why you need to check all around your doors and windows to make sure that you haven't got water in that area and that the wood is not decayed. They might start out by chewing on the decayed wood, but they will also enter sound wood. So that's something you need to really think about. One thing about carpenter ants, that they are very easily identified. They have a rounded thorax, you can see by this picture here, and a single node, that little bump in the middle, we call that a node. 
It's right between the thorax and the abdomen. That is a very, very distinct identification mark to know that you have carpenter ants. But carpenter ants do come in all different sizes. So they may not just be the large one, it might also be a small one. Here are a couple photos of the carpenter ant damage. The photo on the left shows the insect parts and some of the frass that's left over from their chewing. The photo on the right, you can see the damage that, that they caused in the rotting wood. Now, it's really hard for homeowners to get control of carpenter ants, and that's, it's best left to a pest management company. Oregon State University has a great publication with information that you need to know about choosing a competent pest control company. So if you think you have carpenter damage and you get it identified, look up this publication and they will tell you how to make sure that the company that you choose is a competent and company for you to have to come to your home to check it out. Now, carpenter ants may be bad, but sugar ants are just really, really annoying. Sugar ants don't cause damage, but they are a nuisance in your home. Sugar ants don't sting, they can bite, but you won't even know when they bit you because their bite is not painful. Baits containing borax seem to be the most effective for ants when you have them in your home. Now, if you have sugar ants or any ants in your home and you're wanting to identify them, the publication listed on this slide has great color photos and a lot of really good information about plant ID. In the Master Gardener office, when people bring in their ants for identification, we'll put them under the microscope, look, look at all the different parts of the ants, and then we will bring up this this link, the link to this extension publication to figure out which ant it is that, the, that, that you have brought in for us to identify. Box elder bugs, good or bad? Some of you right now, I'm sure are just cringing when you see that picture. Well, I say that they're actually neither. They're just very, very annoying, but most of you are probably gonna say that they're bad. Box elder bugs are a nuisance in the home and on the outside of the home. What they do is they overwinter as adults in protected areas, warm areas. And as they're doing that, as they're, you can see by these pictures, all these box elder bugs on the side of this, this building here, what they do is they hide out in those warm places, but they are not eating at that time. What they do eat is the seeds of box elder, which is type of maple or other maple trees. And sometimes there's a few other ornamental trees, but they're eating the seeds of those trees. So they're not actually causing a problem. No, they are, they are a big problem. I shouldn't put it that way. They're not damaging your property by being on your house or on the buildings but they're just hanging out there, but they are definitely a nuisance. If you do see them, just if they're small enough and you have just a few or if they're inside of your home, you might just pick them out and drop them into some soapy water. If they're outside of your home, you'll need to do what this gentleman's doing and use a shock back to get rid of them all. Then check your home for openings around doors and windows and foundations. That's the place where these bugs will enter inside of your home. So that way you wanna to try to keep them on the outside instead of on the inside. If you grow rhododendrons or azaleas, you've probably come across this little critter. This is the azalea lace bug. Good or bad? Well, they are beautiful, but they are very, very bad. If you were to look at one of these little guys under a microscope, it's just awesome, the color and the way their wings look, they are very, very beautiful, but they are very, very damaging. They're damaging to azaleas and rhododendrons and a few other shrubs too, that we're finding that they are deciding to like a few other shrubs also. They cause damage by sucking the chlorophyll out of the leaves. Both the adults and the nymphs, the nymphs are the, are the youngsters, both the adults and the nymphs feed on the underneath side of the leaves. And when this happens, the upper side of the leaves will either turn this kind of yellowish gray color. And on the underneath side of the leaves, you'll see it looks pretty dirty. And you'll see all these little brown spots. That is the presence of their brownish fecal spots on the underneath side of the leaves. And if you have a lot of heavy damage, sometimes the leaves may drop from the plant. 
Now these photos here show what your plants will look like if you have azalea lace bug damage. So it's really quite easy to identify that. Stress plants are more susceptible to attack than non-stress plants. That just is a logical, that's logical thinking, isn't it? Plants in the sun are reported to be nearly twice as likely to be infested with azalea lace bug as, as plants that are in the shaded area or partial shade. Spraying the plants with a strong stream of water on the under, underneath side of the leaves will help remove some of those bugs. Now the wingless, the nips, the, the youngsters, when they are first come, I was like, how do I say this? I guess I should just tell you, the nips do not have wings. So if you are to spray the underneath side of the leaves when the, when the azalea lace bug is young, you will be dislodging them, they will fall to the ground and they won't be able to fly back up. If you wait until it is an adult and it has wings, you may dislodge it from your plants, but they have a tendency to fly back up. But be very careful about using a broad spectrum insecticide because you want to preserve the beneficial predators that are going to come in and help you get rid of the azalea lace bug. So if you are going to use an insecticide, be very careful, read the directions. And if it says broad spectrum, you're probably not going to want to use that one. Find something else that'll work. And now we have the brown marmorated stink bug. And those of you who grow fruits or berries may have come across these guys. And you may have even seen them inside of your home. And that is definitely not good. But the bad thing about the brown marmorated stink bug, they're not only bad on your plants, but they are very, very stinky also. We call, just call them BMSB. You look up information and if you see the letters BMSB, you'll know they're talking about a brown marmorated stink bug. It is considered an agricultural pest. What the BMSB does, it uses mouth parts to pierce the whole plant and the feeding that it does is causes dimples or these necrot necrotic spots on the fruit. The nymphs and the adults both damage the crops. They survive the winter as adults by entering your house, entering, entering structures. That's how they wanna keep warm waiting for the good weather to come for spring. So once again, just like the box elder bug, try to make sure that you don't have any entrance, any way for them to enter your home. Now, unfortunately, when you have brown marmorated stink bug damage on your fruits, they, you will find them unedible. These two photos of the apple and the Asian pear show you some of the damage that the BMSB has caused. They're not easy to control, but the populations can be reduced by monitoring your, monitoring, monitoring your fruit for the eggs and for the insects. Now, several universities have been looking at introducing a small samurai wasp and it's a parasitoid. And what this does is this parasitoidal wasp attacks the brown marmorated stink bug eggs. So this will also help reduce the population. And of course, if you do find them in your home, or even if you find just a few outdoors, you're not gonna want to squish them because they will stink really bad. In other words, drop them in the toilet or drop them in a, a bucket of soap, soapy water so that the smell doesn't come out quite so much. Now, the brown, brown marmorated stink bug has a lookalike out there that you're not going to want to kill, and it is called the rough stink bug. And you can see by this photo that there are a few differences. The rough stink bug is a predatory stink bug, and it preys on plant-eating insects. So this is the good guy. So even though they do stink, they do keep the bad guys under control. So the rough stink bugs has shoulders that are rough, and the bad guy has smooth shoulders. The, the good stink bug, the rough stink bug, does not have any bands. You can see those photos of the long white bands on the antenna of the brown marmorated stink bug, but you'll notice there are no long bands on the rough stink bug. Also, if you look at that photo, you'll see that the, they're a little bit different in size. If you happen to see a group of them together, together you'll be able to distinct, tell distinctly which one is the rough stink bug because it would be a little bit larger. 
and their noses, their faces are a little bit different. One has a blunt face and one is more pointed. All right, let's go on to carpet beetles, good or bad. Well, here's something that might really surprise you. Carpet beetles are bad when you find them in your home chewing away on your precious things, but outdoors they eat pollen and they help with pollination as they go from flower to flower. So one of the most, they are one of the most common pests of dry organic materials found inside of the home. The larvae are the ones that are doing the damage and they eat a variety of products. It may be very difficult to locate the source of what it is that is bringing them into your home. It takes a lot of looking around to figure that out. Outdoors, they just eat pollen. So that's a good thing. Now, the, like I mentioned, the larval stage is the one that's going to be doing the damage in your home. But you may see some of the adult beetles on your windows. They're attracted to light because they wanna be outdoors so that they can eat the pollen and flowers outside. But when they come back in your home, that's when they lay the eggs, which will hatch into the larva, which is going to cause the damage. Now, as I mentioned, it's sometimes hard to find the source of the problem, but there are some things you can do. You can regularly clean, any, in, up, clean up any spilled food or any accumulated dust. They seem to like dirty things better than clean things. You'll find them. If you have a piece of material or you have a carpet, you will find them on the soiled spots instead of the clean spots. You wanna store your food or your woolens and fur and any other susceptible items in insect-proof containers. Try to exclude the adult beetles during the warm months by using screens and other seal, sealing other openings. Try not to let them inside of your home while they'll be laying their eggs. Remove and destroy any infested material when you find it. You can also treat some of the infested material. If it's small enough, like a stuffed animal or something like that, or clothes, you can put them in the freezer for 48 hours. This will kill the beetle infestation. Or if possible, you could use a heat treatment that has to be up to about 120 degrees for several hours. And if you do have clothing, you can always have it dry cleaned to also get rid of the, the larva. Now, many people confuse lace wings with lace bugs. Lace wing adults are about three quarters of an inch long and they're very delicate looking. Isn't she beautiful? I see them quite often on my window screens. The photo on the right shows the eggs that the female has laid on the very tip of these sl slender silken stalks that are attached to the leaf surface. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. So lace wings are really, really good insects. The adults feed on pollen, plant nectar and aphid honeydew, but it's the larvae that really do a good job because the larvae feed on many, many soft-bodied insects such as aphids and spider mites and thrips and leaf, leaf hoppers. The eggs are laid on these slender stalks on the plants, re really close to the prey. Because what happens is if this green lace bug female were to lay these eggs all in one group, these little larvae are so voracious that as soon as they hatch, they would eat each other. So instead, she has to lay her eggs separately so that they can hatch and go to eating the bad bugs instead of eating each other. That's a pretty neat way that nature takes care of things, doesn't it? Now, flies, are they good or are they bad? Well, it depends. Biting flies are definitely painful. So of course they are bad. There are several flies that are listed as biting flies. Uh, here is a list, some deer flies, horse flies, stable flies, black flies, there's biting midges and there's sand flies. Luckily here in the Pacific Northwest, we don't have as many biting flies as in other parts of the United States or as in other parts of the world, but we still have a few that you're gonna have to be careful with. Then we have those flies that are just they don't bite, but they're quite annoying. House flies and cluster flies and manure flies. But we also have beneficial flies. 
Surfed flies is one. It's also called a hoverfly. Some people call it a flower fly. The surfed fly, you can see by that photo, looks like a bee, but it's not. And it has this really unique ability to hover like a helicopter. It'll hover over a fly, a flower, and go to another flower and hover for a while. The adults are important pollinators and they can be found feeding at flower blossoms. What the adults do is the adults lay their eggs around aphid colonies. That way, when the eggs hatch out, the larvae are right there and their food source is right there too. So the larvae are really great predators of pests such as aphids and scales and thrips and caterpillars. Really, a really good beneficial fly. And Tachinidae is another family of beneficial flies. They are a parasitic fly. The adult tachinid flies resemble house flies, but they vary in size from species to species. Flies place a small batch of eggs directly onto the insect. See that photo at the bottom? All those little white things you see, those are eggs that have been laid on top of that caterpillar. Then what the eggs do, the eggs hatch and then the larva burrow into the insect and then they begin feeding from the inside out. And I know that probably kind of grosses you out a little bit. They are an endoparasitoid, which is a parasite that lives inside another animal or an insect and then kills it. That's how the tachinid flies work. So see, <clears throat> there are bad flies, good flies, and some annoying flies. Here's another type of fly that is a fruit fly. This one is called a spotted wing drosophila. If you grow any type of berries, you've probably come across the spotted wing drosophila. So think about that. Is it good or is it bad? Bad, very, very bad. The spotted wing drosophila is an invasive pest and it targets a wide, wide, wide range variety, a wide variety of fruits and berries. The spotted wing drosophila, what is different, how it's different than the fruit flies that we're used to is this guy, she lays her eggs inside of fruits as it's ripening on your plant. The spotted wing drosophila doesn't wait until your fruit is rotting before she lays her eggs inside. Your fruit doesn't even have to be ripe yet and she will lay her egg inside. And then when she does that, the egg inside will hatch out and the larva will start eating the fruit from the inside out. If you have a lot of these and you happen to catch them, the male flies are very distinct. They have this black spot right up there on the leading edge of each wingtip that you can see from this photo. So here you can see the maggots that have hatched inside of these berries. Now there's a very simple trap that you can build out of cups and apple cider vinegar. OSU and some of the other universities have directions on building and setting out these traps. So if you grow berries, you might want to look up this information. When this pest first came to our area, we saw a lot of damage on our soft berries and fruits, but it seems like homeowners haven't seen as many the last couple of years. We're hoping that there are some beneficial insects out there that are helping to control this problem. That would be the way, the way nature works and hopefully that will help take care of this problem and we won't have to worry about it anymore. Sow bugs and pill bugs. We've all seen these guys around our plants. So are they good or are they bad? Surprise. I know you're thinking they're bad, but they're actually good. Sow bugs and pill bugs inhabit garden soil and dank basements and shading, shady areas of the yard. Well, maybe they're not really good when you find them in the basement or in your home, but that, then they're just kind of annoying. Now, sow bugs, like I mentioned, sow bugs and pill bugs, they inhabit dark soil, dank basements and shady areas. They feast on decaying plant material. They are not hurting plant material, but if it's already decaying, that's what they are doing. They are cleaning it up. They're deemed guilty by association because they are often found feeding around your produce. But remember, something else caused that damage in the first place. These guys are just there to clean it up. 
So either the slugs or something else, they were the ones that did the initial damage. These guys are great opportunists. Flea beetles, are they good or are they bad? I think I skipped a page here. Nope, guess not, sorry about that. So flea beetles, I'm sure those of you that grow vegetables, you know exactly what the answer to this one is. Yeah, these guys are a nemesis of the vegetable garden. Flea beaters are small and black and they jump like a flea, but they're leaf chewers, they're not blood suckers. They're very difficult to control because they locate their host plants by sensing or smelling the plant's chemical cues. So as soon as your plants start growing, that's why they are definitely a problem when your vegetables are just beginning to grow. They can sense that that plant is growing because it's sending off these cues, these chemical cues. So in comes the flea beetles to do the damage. You can see that the flea beetles have caused damage by chewing holes in the leaves. There are trap crops such as radishes. These might lure the beetles away from a main crop, a crop that you really don't want to have damaged. Putting floating row covers over your plants when you first plant them out or when they're first starting to grow, that, that can exclude the beetles when the plants are very, very young, but you're gonna have to be careful and make sure that they don't get underneath it accidentally. Crop rotation is helpful. If you have beetles, say you have beetles on your beans plants, well, the next year you're gonna wanna move those bean plants to another area because the adults overwinter in trash around the field margins of your garden. Then they lay their eggs in your garden area in May. And that's why sanitation around the garden area is very, very helpful. And why crop rotation is also very helpful. Millipedes and centipedes. Well, here's another one that might surprise you. Centipedes are good. Centipedes are these flattened, we call them hundred leggers. They run rapidly for cover. When you turn over a rock or, or a log, they run really fast. They're active night hiding, hunting predators and they feed on soil dwelling insects. They don't feed on plants, they feed on insects. They require a very humid environment for survival. And we often find them under pet pots and things like that that have been watered quite frequently. Stone centipedes are commonly found in the Pacific Northwest gardens, but they will bite, so be very careful if you're going to handle one of those. Millipedes are also good. Millipedes are slow moving, we call them thousand leggers because they have a lot more legs than a millipede does. These are also found in damp environments such as moss or under damp leaves or stones. The millipedes feed on dead, decaying plant material, just like the pill bugs and the sow bugs do. So they're not, they're not feeding on the good parts of the plant, they're feeding on the dead or de decaying parts of the plant. Ecologically, millipedes are like earthworms. In other words, they recycle plant nutrients back into the soil. Sometimes when damp conditions become really scarce, you can see them, they try to enter your building because they're looking for, for damp environments to go to. So a lot of times people may find these in their garage or around the side of their homes. Spider mites, good or bad? And you're all thinking, bad? Well, there are good mites and bad mites. The good mites are called predatory mites. There are many species of predatory mites and they feed on the plant feeding mites. The predatory mites, they overwinter as adult females in protected places. And the adults become active in the spring and then be, begin feeding on the prey. The, the really neat thing about these predatory mites is that when the plant feeding mite population increases, it also causes the predatory mite population to increase. So the higher the plant feeding mites get, the higher the predatory mites get. And the photo you see here is a predatory mite feeding on a plant feeding mite. Then we also have the bad spider mites. There are several species of spider mites that cause damage to deciduous or evergreen and coniferous ornamental plants. 
feed, they feed on the leaves and it causes the stippling, bronzing or leaf dropping. Sometimes you'll see that the plant is covered with this fine silk webbing. If you see that on your plant, that's a pretty good indication that you have some spider mite infestation. The mites occur more in hot weather than they do in dry weather. Excuse me, cool weather. Okay, since spider mites are a sucking insect, this photo shows the stippling damage from their feeding. You can see the difference in the color of what it should be and what, what it is right now. A strong spray of water on the infected plants can help reduce populations because it will help dislodge the dirt and the dust, which favor an increase in the mite numbers. High levels of nitrogen in the foil, foliage, sorry, I don't seem to be able to talk very well today. Uh, high levels of nitrogen encourage spider mite reproduction. And the predatory mites and insects such as ladybugs and green lacewings, like we saw, those will also help with their control. And once again, avoid the use of broad spectrum insecticides, which also kill the beneficials. There's something else that I want you to know. A lot of you are organic gardeners. A lot of you want to be more organic gardeners. So you're probably thinking, oh, I know, I will go out and purchase an organic insecticide that will help get rid of my plant because I'm being organic and I'm being good. But whether that organ, if that organic chemical says that it is broad spectrum, it is also going to kill your beneficial insects, not just the bad ones. It's going to kill the good ones too. So just because you want to be organic and just because the product says organic doesn't mean it is only going to kill the bad, it will also kill the good. So be very, very careful, no matter what you're using. If it says broad spectrum, it's going to kill beneficials. And the best way that we can encourage these beneficials into our area is by planting a lot of plants that they like to come to and not spraying to kill them. Okay, ground beetles. When you usually, you usually see them when you're digging in the soil, you'll be digging around and all of a sudden up will come this little brown, I should say big black or brown beetle. So you think they're good or do you think they're bad? They're good, very good. There are, cores, there are other types of beetles that are not good, but the beetles in the carabid family, which includes ground beetles and tiger beetles, these are beneficial. The adult beetles are usually dark or metallic and they're nocturnal hunters. You'll see them hiding beneath rocks and logs and leaves, things like that. The larvae are grubs. They have these large mandibles, these large mouth parts. And you usually find them also in the soil under bark or in plant debris at the ground level. They are going to be eating, remember, they are eating ground dwelling insects. So the adult and the larva both are very predaceous. So they're going to be there eating all the bad guys that are on the ground. Now, um, OSU is researching the use of beetle banks near agricultural crops. And what they've done is they have found that because they want these good beneficials near their crops, they've built up these mounds or banks of soil where the beetles and other beneficial insects such as spiders can live and be happy and they will establish this big healthy population and that way they are out there taking care of the bad guys near the agricultural crops. It's quite an interesting way to use beneficials in agricultural situations. So if you look up information, OSU has a lot of different publications on how agricultural communities have built these beetle banks and how well it's working for them. Very, very interesting. Grasshoppers, are they good or are they bad? And if any of you are from back east, you're saying bad really loud right now, I'm sure. Well, grasshoppers are very bad if they eat your plants and eat your crops. But when your kids or your grandkids play with them, they're not really bad, they're pretty fun. So here's a short list uh, and the dates that some of our invasive pests have entered the Pacific Northwest. 
The USDA and the ODA and a lot of the universities keep a close lookout for invasive pests that are trying to make a foothold in our area. A lot of research and management options are going on to avoid these newcomers from becoming a problem. Sometimes we win the battle. Unfortunately, sometimes the pest wins the battle. So now, some of you may not like insects, but what would it be like if we lived in a world without insects? Well, for one thing, you wouldn't have to worry about ants invading your picnic, but then you wouldn't have any food to put in your picnic basket because there wouldn't have been anybody out there to pollinate and help us make that food. And you wouldn't have any place to sit because you would just be surrounded by dead and decaying plants and animals. So whether they are good or bad or just annoying, I'm glad the insects are here. And I'm sure you are too. So now I know that was pretty quick. I'm hoping that some of you have written in questions and my co-host Leah will come on and read me some of those questions and I'll do the best I can to answer them for you. Hi, Hi Leah. Jane. That was great. And we do have some questions. Some of Good. them are mine. Uh, <laughs> I want to go back to the ground beetles first. Um, digging in the garden, I find these grubs. And I and another uh, person watching this are going, okay, so we dig up a grub. How do we know if it's a good grub or a bad grub? Yeah. You'll have to either look up the information yourself, try to find some identifying you know, publications out there, or bring them to the office or take a photo, send them in to us and see if the, we can identify them for you. The larval stage of insects are really hard to identify as what, what they are. It's easier, of course, when they become an adult, but there are a lot of books and publications out there that will distinctly, they're called dichotomous keys that will let you go through step by step and figure out, you know, it'll say, is this insect have does it have wings? Yes or no. And then if it has yes, then you go to the next one. So there's a lot of dichotomous keys out there, a lot of information that will help you get to what type of insect it is. So are we fairly certain that like if we found it, find it right around the roots of a plant, that that's going to be something that is probably eating the roots? Is that It possibly could be because there are a lot of caterpillars, there are a lot of moth larvae a lot of cutworms that you'll see under the ground. And then, but then again, you'll also see the, the grubs, the good beetles. Okay. But there is a difference. A, a grub has a different leg system than a caterpillar. I, I don't, I can't exactly explain how, but if you look at the difference between a caterpillar and a grub, you'll be able to find, you'll be able to tell. Okay. But not all grubs, not all grubs are from a good beetle. So that's when you're going to have to identify it again. Okay. Bye. Um, any tips for cutworms? They mowed many of my seedlings down last year. Yes, they do. They do. They, yeah, they're really bad. Yeah, mostly the cutworms, you'll see them in the evening. So go out kind of at dusk and look around your plants. And if you find them, just pick them off and throw them into uh, soapy water or squish them or something like that. There is some, an organic, a, organic product called BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, and it works on only works on caterpillar larvae, but it usually only works when they are very, very small. And when they, after they've grown to a more of an adult stage, it doesn't seem to work as well. So the best thing is to really keep an eye on your plants and go out there and you can pick them up, maybe even dig around the dirt a little bit to see if they happen to be right on top of the soil and dispose of them that way. Okay. Um, Priscilla Robinson, a master gardener, I think her grandchildren want to know, Katie and Emma want to know where insects go in the winter. That's a good question, a very good question. Some of them find warm places to hide. Other insects, instead of them overwintering themselves, they will lay their eggs in a very protected area and the egg will overwinter because it isn't as delicate as the adult. 
and then that egg will hatch out in the spring or summer and become the adult. So sometimes the adults do not live through the winter time, but they are going to be reproducing. So to have the, so that we can still have them the next summer, or the next year, continue the cycle. Okay. Um, how do you get rid of squash or cucumber beetles? Assuming those are bad. Yes, squash and cucumber beetles are very bad. The, the bad thing about cucumber beetles, and that's why crop rotation really works because cucumber beetles will lay their eggs and the larva, they will overwinter in the ground. They will overwinter in your garden. And then the next spring, they will come up and start chewing on things. So that's why crop rotation is a very good idea. Once again, sometimes crap, trap, I keep saying crap, <laughs> trap crops do work sometimes if you put in radishes that you really don't care if you want to eat them. Sometimes they will eat the radish leaves because that is their favorite and they will stay away from some of the ones that are your favorite plant. And that's probably about it. You can also try to pick them off if possible. Yeah. Some years they're worse than others. Okay. Um, sticking with the beetle theme, what about lily beetles? Are there... About what? Lily beetles? I, I do don't... not know what a lily beetle... Oh, probably beetles they find on their lilies. I don't Is know. That That's all it says. So I don't know what kind of beetle they're talking okay. about. So that would be something that they could ask um, the Master Gardener's extension and yes. submit that, right? And always send photos too. Yes. The photos of the insects, <laughs> that helps us that identify. It really helps, yes. Okay. Um, coddling moths, do they have any beneficial value? No. Coddling moths are very destructive to our fruit industry. There are coddling moth traps out there. There are a pheromone trap that will uh, track the males to the trap and then they, it's a sticky situation. They are very, very destructive to apples and pears. OSU does have some information called managing diseases and pests in your home orchard. If you look that information up, just Google it. You'll be able to find a list and it'll tell you coddling moth and what type of, if you, if you do have to use a temp chemical, what is the least problematic chemical to use or the least destructive chemical? Um, what's the word I'm thinking of? The least toxic, thank you. Yeah. What is the least Anytime. toxic chemical to use <laughs> um, to help alleviate that problem? Okay. Um, last year, my husband put socks around our apples is that i mean it seemed to work yeah. for us is on a small scale sure. yes that's a really it's a if you have a small apple tree and you're able to reach all of the apples there, that's kind of a fun thing, a kind of experimental thing to do. Some people put old nylons or silken thought socks around them. Some people will put a, a paper bag just around that single apple just to keep the insects out. Mm -hmm. It's it, kind of a fun thing, especially for children. <laughs> or retired men. <laughs> he seems to enjoy it. So... Okay, um, I have a couple questions on sugar ants. Why do they come in the house? What are they after? Because there seems to be no rhyme or reason to when they come into my into the questioner's nook. Yes, and it seems like if the people that I have talked to that have sugar ant problems have them over and over and over again, and they're just looking for food mainly, and and they are a big problem. That's why. Whenever a client calls us and says they have a problem inside of their home, the answer that we give them, they're never happy with because the answer is clean, clean, clean. <laughs> and sometimes no matter how much you clean, those little sugar ants will still come inside of your home. So the best thing to do is to get some type of a bait that has a borax in it. It's usually a liquid bait that you can put down. You can find their trail. So you put it near their trail. And what they do is they eat the bait, they take it back to their nest, they feed it to the rest of them, and that kills them off there. Unfortunately, they probably will come back again the following year. They, they are annoying little things. Um, 
one and that was a question of how do you have a, a pet safe um thing yeah and what i have found is that i have a bait trap that has a gel and the and it goes mm -hmm. inside that trap but then i put it i find the where the ants are going and i put it tuck it away and kind of cover it up so that the dogs can't see it and i yet yes. to have a problem with that so yes Definitely for pets and children, you need to make sure that it is someplace where they cannot get into it. Yeah. Yes, very good. Okay, um, how do you get rid of scale insects? Scales are hard because the problem, what you, you have to do is you have to get them, what a scale insect is, they call it a scale because you have babies that are inside of this hard shell, this scale that's on the outside. So we see this and we think, oh, that is not the critter. All the critters are inside. Well, at a certain time of year, and I believe it's May or June, but don't quote me on this, they will hatch out from inside of that little shell, inside of that little scale there, and they will start moving through the tree. You have to get them during that stage. There are some sprays that you can spray on them during that stage of their life to kill them. If you have the scale on a young plant, I know one year I planted a plum tree. It was still very young, had a lot of scale. I just went with my fingernail and just scraped all the little scales off. While it was young, it was easy. Um, if you have them on a larger tree, you're going to have a little bit more trouble with it. Okay. Um, Katie, again, Priscilla's granddaughter, I assume. Uh, assume hi, Katie. Says these bugs look scary. Do millipedes bite people? The centipedes bite, but I do not believe the millipedes do. Okay, so the ones with lots and lots of legs don't bite people, but the centipedes can. Don't quote me on that. I'm going to have to look that up. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Maybe Priscilla. Tell Katie I will, call, I will find out and I will call her grandma and let her know. Okay, there you go. Personal service there. Okay, uh, uh, clarification on the lily beetle. Um, it says it's the red lily beetle that she's curious about. Does that ring a bell again? No, I'm no. afraid I've never come across it. I would okay. have to look that information so again, up. That would be find one, take a picture, submit mm -hmm. it to the Master Gardener uh, question and answer, mm -hmm. you know, online. And um, that would be just a really good way to, to find that out. Yeah. Sometimes Great. Master Gardeners get stumped too. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm just, I have. Um, I heard in a master gardener seminar that most of the ladybugs you can buy are Asian ladybugs, which I've read can outcompete natives. Several nurseries dispute that Asians are sold. Do you have any thoughts on this? Well, a lot of them probably are Asian ladybugs, but the problem with if it is a native ladybug, they're usually collecting them. They they collect them a lot from Colorado, and bring them here. And they're not they're not going to stay. So I know how I know it is fun, especially when you have children to buy ladybugs and then let them go. But they're not going to they this is not where they want to be. They're going to fly away to where they want to be. Yeah. So actually. The better way to get the ladybugs into your area is to plant a lot of insectiary plants, a lot of different plants that the ladybugs will come to that the aphids come to, and then the ladies bugs will come to to eat. So that's a better way to get all the beneficials in than, than purchasing them and bringing them into your area. But if you do wanna purchase some, just make sure, find out from the company, are these Asian? They're like 12 spotted, 18 spotted, 16 spotted, something like that, Asian ladybugs. Make sure you find out which kind they are and if they are a native ladybug for, native to the United States or not. And Sean just put a link in the chat about how to um, good plants for insectaries. So oh. just kind of, she's on top of it. Good, um, thanks, Sean. And, and get a link to link to that. Um, I am amazed with all of the insects that love to eat aphids. Why I still have them? I mean, well, <laughs> there's you, so many. <laughs> there are, but some people might not realize that. Aphids, some aphids are born pregnant. So that's, that kind of goes to show you, uh, they're born pregnant. So yeah. 
That's why we have a lot of them, but they're yummy for the other guys to yeah. eat. <laughs> um, I found uh, lady beetles curled up inside a calla lily blossom this fall. Oh. And it was so cute. And I just, and I, and I looked at all the callas and there were all these little ladybugs in there. And I said, well, oh. I've never seen that before. Part of the fun of being a gardener is looking around and seeing what's out there. Um, we have a question on white flies. Any tips for white flies? I'm going to have to look up that information. I know I was, I was afraid I was going to get a lot of these questions. <laughs> One thing I say a lot to people, master gardeners don't know all the answers off the top of our head. We just kind of have to know where to go to find the answer. And that's one of those. I'm going to have to look it up to find the answer to that. Because I, I know a few years ago, we've had a lot of problems with white flies. I personally, in my own yard and garden, have not had that problem. So I'm going to have to look up some information. I, I apologize. I can't answer that for you right now. It's, I think they're very, very tough. And I do remember a couple of years ago in the fall, it looked like it was snowing. There were just yes. so many here in, in the area where I live. Yes. Um, somebody wants to know how to get rid of black vine beetles. Oh, oh, yeah. Well, they ha you have to kind of know their whole life cycle. So... And I don't know what it is. Are they on their rhododendrons or what they are on? There's a lot of different, there's a lot of different methods. Some people will put uh, sticky traps around the bot, like, like say it's on a rhododendron. They'll put a sticky trap around the trunk of the rhododendron because the beetles will be climbing up the trunk and that way they get stuck to the sticky track, trap. In the fall, when the larvae are in the ground, there are some drenches that you can put on the ground. These, uh, these are ne nematode drenches that you can pour onto the ground and these nematodes go into the ground and then they attack the larvae that are underneath there. You just have to read the directions because the temperature has to be a certain, certain temperature and the nematodes do not go sideways. They only go straight down. So you have to make sure that, that, that you get it all the way around. It works pretty good in containers, but not quite as well out in the yard. So you need to figure out the life cycle and then you need to and keep, a, keep a really good watch on what you're doing. Monitoring your pet, your plants is very important. So go out there more often. You see one, of course, just squish it when you see it and monitoring them. And I, I'm sorry that I didn't put information in there. I should have. Um, integrated Pest Management, IPM, is if you look up information on IPM, there's a lot of really good information that will tell you how to non-tox, you know, the best way to take care of problems and still be good to nature. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's hard to answer these questions like this. I know, it's really on the spot. I'm going to take this next one. It's our last okay. question. And Robbie was asking, with so many aphids, do they have any benefit? And then Robbie answered the question saying, well, maybe it's because they feed all these other bugs, which I think is great. It's, you know, the circle of life kind of thing. Um, yes. It's, yeah, so... Yeah, and in some ways, I guess they're not only bad, but they're good too because they're a good food source. So that's right, circle of life. You're right. Yeah. There we go. Okay, we have no more questions, and I think we're just about done. So thank you so much, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Jane, for all the great work and the quick thinking on your feet with those questions. That's amazing. Good job. Thank you.